Welcome everyone to today's event. Uh, I'm Nathan Cruz of USDA's National Ag Statistics Service. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this third virtual government career fair uh, sponsored by NIS. We've assembled a really nice uh, lineup of speakers today. Uh, you'll hear from Dean Fullman of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, Greg Lawson representing the Energy Information Administration, and Jennifer Parker of CDC's NCHS. Uh, we want to allot plenty of time to answer uh, questions. Uh, so as this is going on, you can use the Q&A uh, feature to enter questions and I'll try and moderate those and direct them to the right panelists or to the, to the group uh, when the time arises. Uh, just a couple quick words on your Zoom settings. You may find that you need to uh, toggle between speaker view and gallery view to make sure you can view the content. Um, upon completion of today's uh, event, you'll receive evaluations about the session, and this really uh, appreciates the feedback that uh, you can provide for that. Uh, additionally, you'll be sent a link to a recording of the session, as well as links to the slides on the NIST website. And on that note, uh, on the website for today's event, you'll be able to find links to past career fairs. I think there are six in all, including two previous career fairs uh, focused on government. Uh, if you're applying for government jobs, uh, many of those processes will begin at uh, usajobs.gov. And I'll also mention this resource, OMB's Blue Book, um, uh, the most current one is for 2018, but it has information about the, the structure and makeup of the federal statistical system, a large number of agencies uh, listed that may employ statisticians or data scientists, and uh, you can possibly learn more about uh, prospective uh, agencies or places of employment through that. With that, let me stop sharing my screen and introduce Dean Fulman of uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Thank you. Um, can you hear me, Nathan? Yeah, yes, we hear you. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, I'd like to thank Nathan and James for inviting me to speak here. And also, um, I'm, I'm happy to be speaking to, you, to all you people who are excited and um, looking for a new job. And I'd like to explain what happens, the kind of work that we do at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So there are actually 27 different institutes at the National Institutes of Health, and we're the second biggest one, NIAID. The other major institute is the Cancer Institute over here, and the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Um, there are other institutes as well, and I just mentioned that because I'll be speaking about my experience, but there are other opportunities at other institutes within the National Institutes of Health. My institute, one of the 27, as you now know, is headed by Dr. Fauci and my direct supervisor is Dr. Cliff Lane. I, um, I'm really proud to work in this institute. I think they're excellent people and there's sort of a, a really nice environment, I think, that comes from the top down within this institute. We're located below uh, Dr. Lane in the biostatistics research branch, so let me talk about that a little. So here we are, uh, there's like 30 people or so within the group, and I just wanted to share a picture that I've made recently of everyone in the group. So the staffing in our group, to get a little more quantitative, we have 15 PhD level statisticians, um, five master's level statisticians. We also have a newly minted clinical trials research section, which is devoted to running clinical trials, mostly for um, outbreaks or new diseases that pop up. And so there's a group of people devoted to the organization and running of that. We also have a, a somewhat academic-y kind of feel within the group and we have postdocs. And currently we have one postdoc from uh, Carnegie Mellon, my alma mater, so I'm happy to be working with her. The, the basic structure is that the PhD uh, statisticians are assign projects and they work pretty much independently on small teams sometimes, but often um, by themselves or they also work with master's level. So the master's level statisticians help the PhDs with 
programming, report writing, data analysis, and so on. So I wanted to describe the kind of work that we do at a high level to start with, and then go into some examples to sort of give you some texture. So at NIH, about 90% of our budget is actually given to outside researchers. So researchers at the University of Washington or Rochester or wherever that are doing um, different kinds of research. Typically, these are you know, medical related experiments and often the kind of stuff we get in is randomized clinical trials. We'll you'll randomize half the people to get a placebo and then the other half to get a drug that we hope works. And we are intimately involved sort of in understanding the statistical framework for that, how to design it, how many people to have, how do you analyze the data, what is your, gonna be your primary measure of success, all those design statistical aspects we're intimately involved in. For these extramural projects, uh, which work a lot with outside people, this is more like a big science or a big team approach, and so we're part of that. You can be a voice at a big table with these, um, helping design it, and then also we formal review protocols that come through these different networks. That's one of the things we do. <clears throat> Another thing that we do is a little more, um, I suppose, typical for applied statisticians where we collaborate with people at NIH who are uh, working for tenure. So I mentioned about 90% of our budget goes to extramural research, about 10% goes to intramural research. These are researchers within the Bethesda who work for NIH and are um, striving for tenure. And so they have to publish, run experiments and so on. We get involved in that and, and it's a little more like soup to nut statisticians will we'll be involved in some of the main thing, the things I mentioned before, the sample size, the design and analysis, but we're totally hands-on with all of this. And we, like I said, go from the cradle to the grave of the experiment. We'll author the paper with the principal investigator and um, much more hands-on kind of thing. I think more of what a traditional statistician does in applied work. A couple other things, we also do special projects. Uh, I, I wrote stuff we do because I guess that's I meant because that's within our division, um, headed by Dr. Cliff Lane. And so this is, I, I mentioned this earlier, where there'll be an outbreak of a new uh, disease like Ebola or COVID-19 or a new kind of flu. And we'll try and um, quickly assemble a team to work and study that, do a randomized trial to see uh, what new treatment might be uh, useful for this new disease. So that's a very different tempo from these other kinds of things, but it's a, a major and expanding thing of what we do. Um, I didn't put this on the slide, but uh, uh, I, I guess the fourth major thing is we also write, we also do methodology. So we'll write papers for statistical journals. Um, that might be 10 to 20% to 30% of what we do. So there's a sort of academic -y kind of feel. Generally, these methodology papers are um, inspired or derived from these collaborations uh, that I mentioned here. So the philosophy of this group is uh, basically I try and support people and let them grow. And uh, up here I have sort of a nanad, what I think is like a guild system for how you go from apprentice to journeyman to master craftsman. So that's a real loose analogy about what our view is. So when new PhDs come in or masters, we align them with a particular branch. It might be on HIV disease. It might be on parasitic diseases. It might be on vaccines. And then with that opportunity comes a responsibility for you to somehow get integrated and develop a rapport with the collaborators within that branch. And now you do that, you know, you have to figure out, you know, we help you with that, but basically, um, you know, you're, you're expected to develop into a scientist within that particular realm of, of uh, biological discipline, whatever it is. And ultimately, you know, you're a, a scientist working with the people in the laboratory, you author papers with them, you also write methodology papers inspired, inspired by that. Mm, I think the view of the group is, or my view is that we want to support interests of people uh, as long as it's sort of broadly aligned with improving public health, which is pretty broad remit. And so some of the, um, 
things that people get into and become experts are like causality, which is, you know, kind of statistical discipline or subdiscipline. Some people are interested in adaptive clinical trials. So how do you bring in different treatments rigorously? How do you repeatedly evaluate them? And so on. That's a whole thing too, actually. Um, and also there's a person in the group who's interested in developing training for statisticians in sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa. We call that capacity building because it's sort of uh, building up the capacity, the human capital of, of quantitative people within that continent. But that's another thing sort of just to give you a sense of the breadth of uh, the kind of things that we do. So I wanted to now quickly just give three examples of projects that we do. And, you know, we work in infectious diseases, so COVID-19 is a huge part of our lives right now. And I thought I would just sort of uh, tap into the well of what we're doing. So I mentioned we have a special projects group that tries to uh, study ongoing or outbreaking diseases. And so this was assembled quite quickly to initiate and run a, a randomized clinical trial comparing placebo to an antiviral drug called remdesivir. And it was really fast, as, as you might imagine. The uh, people in the group, Lori Dodd served as the principal statistician for this, and so was involved in, in designing the study and a lot of soup to nuts activities. And we had other people in the group, Mike Proshan and Tyler Bonnet working on this as well. The study got an answer pretty quickly, which showed a, um, a moderate benefit of remdesivir. There was a 30% faster recovery on remdesivir. <laughs> And so I, I viewed this as sort of a double in a way, you know, a baseball analogy, that um, it, it's something that's solid and, and beneficial and, and can be built on. This was announced um, by our Institute Director, Dr. Fauci, at the White House up there. And the um, FDA has recently given emergency use authorization for this drug. So that's available now, um, and they're doling it out. Another thing that we're involved in prevention is um, planning for vaccines. And right now we're planning for how to do vaccine trials for COVID-19. There's a lot of candidates, many, many decisions to make, many issues in terms of design. I just wanted to touch on one briefly here. I mentioned earlier that part of what we do when we design clinical trials is to uh, define how we'll measure success. What is the outcome, which you might call Y, or we call an endpoint for success. And a couple of endpoints that have been considered are either infection, which just means that you are positive, you have viral RNA within with you, or another possibility is disease, where you have viral RNA that we can detect, and you also have symptomatic disease, so you're sick. And um, which one of these would be more sensitive to vaccine effects, which is more important as a public health readout? Uh, we have to think that through. One, and part of that thinking through involves sort of simulations. We'll simulate uh, on the computer what a clinical trial might will look like uh, under certain assumptions about how effective the vaccine is and how does the vaccine impact these different categories. So. I give it a little example here of where the disease is kind of rare. We're going to recruit widely. And so the overall attack rate might be 2% people infected out of all the people that we bring into this study. And so we might see an outcome like this where the effect of the vaccine is to basically lessen disease severity. So we can simulate clinical trials like this, make different assumptions, and this helps us in the design stage figure out what should be our endpoint or how we measure success. <clears throat> so we do a lot of randomized clinical trials, but also in this institute, we get involved in um, assays, which are ways of measuring things related to infectious disease. That's kind of a very loose and broad definition, but um, it is kind of a loose and broad area. And I'm, I'm, I'm just giving one example here, I guess. This is a, uh, a way of detecting um, viral RNA for, say, COVID-19 through a nasopharyngeal swab. We take a sample like that and, and have a machine that will, with every cycle, double the amount of viral RNA. So if you have a small bit, after a while, you keep doubling, and it gets to be a large amount. And we can measure the large amount by looking at 
the light intensity in this machine that um, produces, uh, that, that tells us how much viral RNA was, was present. So anyway, this looks kind of statistical, right? It's got a curve, there's a cycle number, which is each cycle it in theory doubles. So there's statistical issues in this. There's also statistical issues in like another readout, which is a memory of whether you've been infected or not. If you've been infected with most pathogens, you'll make these little uh, Y-shaped things called antibodies, proteins that will latch on to whatever germ it was. And we can measure the intensity of that using something like this. So there's different intensities of color and how do we map that into a yes, no answer. That's pretty statistical too. So anyway, those are the examples I wanted to get and now I'll dial back again into like a more high level thing. So the skills we look for is good um, theoretical training, I would say. So to understand principles of statistics and how to formulate new things is pretty important because you know we're you know we're doing new stuff a lot of the time. It's really important in this instance to, to have excellent communication skills. So you're understood. I think most places will say that, and that's true in most places. I think it's a, especially important in my institute. And another thing, you know, you'll hear, and it's true that as a statistician, you'll be working in a particular applied area. You need to understand what's happening in that area, and it's especially true at NIAID. So you need to understand immunology. And I, I strongly encourage new people who come on board to take a graduate level class in immunology to understand the basic language of what we do. You need to be able to think quickly on your feet and sort of how to formulate a statistical approach to a scientific question when it's not teed up as, oh, should I do a Wilcoxon or a t-test? It won't be like that usually. And so you'll have to have sort of a, a vision skill to be able to formulate what's going on. Um, people need to work independently, and a big thing is to uh, work well in the group that we have. So the career path, I think it, it's that guild system I talked about where you generally um, arise to a particular stature. Ultimately, you should work independently and become recognized in that field. And other institutes, as I mentioned, hire statisticians. They're a little different than we are, um, but there's a lot of similarities. And my group is, we'll probably hire a couple people in the fall to master's level, maybe a PhD in the winter. And just so you understand how we go about that, I usually email the department chairs, advertise on these websites, and also advertise in Amstat News. And that's sort of how we get the ball rolling for um, hiring. So with that, I'll show you some more shining faces and move on to the next person. All right, Dean, uh, thank you very much for your, your presentation. Uh, I'll remind our 30 plus attendees that they're welcome to submit uh, questions at any time using the question and answer session, or uh, a question and answer chat window. And uh, let's invite Greg Lawson to uh, share his material on behalf of Energy Information Administration. Okay, <clears throat> I believe I'm sharing. I believe I'm off mute. That's true. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I also thank you for inviting me to talk with you all today. Um, this is uh, my own views here of uh, working at EIA. So the overview is I'm going to talk about, it's a, it's a long prelude to getting to these uh, career fair questions at the end, but I'm going to talk about EIA and then my experience how I got there and what it's like now that I'm here, and a disclaimer that these these are my own views. This isn't you know the official stuff that represents CIA. This is just this is Greg's views here. So okay, real quick, it's the U.S. Energy Information Administration. It is the principal uh, federal statistical agency. It's within the U.S. Department of Energy, and it's in Washington D.C. There's a image there of our building, the Forrestal Building on Independence Avenue Southwest, off the mall. Um, so EIA was created in 1977 alongside the formal creation of DOE. It was under President Carter and from the get-go uh, by charter, it was, it's always been policy neutral. Um, and in our agency of over 300 full-time employees, it's led by a single political appointee with the title of the administrator. 
Um, we probably have about a similar number of contractors uh, who help us get our work done. And some of them sit on site with us and some, some are off site. So we produce a lot of products and serve several roles. So just to orient you, um, I didn't put in an org chart uh, for you, but it, in general, EIA has got two main halves, if you will. Um, one half is concerned with survey. Survey, can, we conduct surveys, uh, about 60 some odd surveys that are generating official US statistics. And they range from a survey which has conducted every hour, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to some that uh, happen every few years, um, while well, well, most are weekly or, or monthly. And just to give you a preview, the survey I'm most associated with is conducted every few years. There's another half of the agency, the so-called analysis half, which deals in projections. So from, from its creation, EIA had the purpose of also producing official outlooks and projections. And this is done via modeling. So statisticians wearing, you know, a heavy modeling hat looking forward. Um, and this varies from a product which gives monthly values to energy quantities of interest, you know, production, generation, prices, um, and the like, uh, out to two years. And that's in the U.S. And there's also some annual projections which go out to 30 years. There's, there's a domestic version as well as, a, as an international one. So that kind of sets EI off a little from other statistical agencies that we have this dual purpose of surveys as, as well as projections. In addition, we produce um, integrated statistics. So this is a team which compiles and compounds um, all the survey results basically and puts it in the guise of, of total energy. So, you know, everything has got the same units and conversion factors and it places all the, con all the results in context, both historically, but also, you know, for a given year, you can trace things from primary sources to their inevitable end uses. It's pretty neat because um, there's a lot of information, of course, and it got to get your head around it. So this team is, uh, does a lot of the work for people. There's also an analysis role. Um, there's regular analyses. You can go to our website and read Today in Energy every day, which is a, a light analysis piece. There's also larger analyses that happen throughout um, and even some ad hoc ones at the request of Congress occasionally. So there's an educational role we serve. Again, on our website, you can find Energy Explained and Energy Kids, and that's pretty good resources. They're praised uh, highly and um, visited widely. And we also produce a so-called uh, principal economic indicator. So our agency produces the weekly natural gas storage report, and when it drops on Thursday mornings, markets tend to move, so that's kind of exciting. Um, okay, who, who are our employees? Um, majority of EIA employees, I would call the core four <laughs> job series here, We've got mathematical statisticians, survey statisticians, industry economists, and operations research analysts. And those little four digit codes are the uh, OPM, Office of Personnel Management codes for those job series. And each one, if you read about them, have very technical, you know, definitions of what your uh, transcripts must read to qualify as a mathematical statistician versus an economist. But uh, at, in practice at EIA, these four, they all just feel like different guises of statisticians. So the work we do often requires really experience across many disciplines and people, regardless of their title, they help out as they're able. Um, th there's no official data scientist position yet. Um, there's certainly not an OPM job series yet called data scientist, but if you, you know, stick your finger in the wind, they're definitely trending that way. Uh, other positions at EIA, though, um, we have engineers like of different types, petroleum engineers and such, uh, management program analysts. Uh, we have IT and web ops specialists, public affairs specialists, technical writers. There's summer interns. There's also the opportunity to do details like across places within within EIA or even within DOE. So it's, um, it's good to know. But that that core four really is probably about two thirds of the people at, at EIA. When you um, there's management, of course, <laughs> um, the team leads and office directors. They a lot of them have actually been promoted from within. Um, EIA and to the point where team lead positions, their titles are just typically supervisory versions of those four core positions. 
but um, office directors and higher, they're typically in the senior executive service. So, you know, above a GS-15 there, um, uh, up there. EIA, we also have uh, four senior level, so-called SL technical experts. These are uh, very special appointments um, that uh, sit above the GS scale as well, but have no supervisory roles. They're just kind of black belt technicians that help with things. My role, uh, just so you're aware, I'm an operations research analyst, though I tell people I'm a government statistician. <laughs> Uh, our community. So really, you know, this sounds like filler, but it's true. We have a highly collaborative and engaged workplace environment where diversity really is a strength. And, you know, you can pretty much assign whatever access you want there of academic background, but also demographics. It's, it's a pretty great place to be. There's managerial support for continued training and attending conferences. There's also support for communities of interest. So, you know, that means Python users and people in the project management, but it also there's like a book club, for instance. So like that's, it's nice to see that it's a warm community that way. To echo what, what Dean was saying, it often reminds me of, of academia. You know, there's typically shorter time scales, not as much emphasis on publishing, but you know, I, it feels like that sometimes. And I, I gotta say, I feel like I'm surrounded by smart people. And uh, luckily they're nice, smart people. So it, it's, a, it's a good warm place to be. But uh, so how did I get here? My, uh, I, I, I had a childhood love for the weather <laughs> uh, phenomenology. I, I loved hurricanes and lightning and such. And uh, I rediscovered that love in college and was able to actually major in it. And then I went off and did a PhD in atmospheric science. And somewhere along the way, I got tricked. Um, and I got further, with each step, I got further and further away from the phenomenology that I love that, that drew me in. And I I suddenly ended up a, an applied mathematician or an applied statistician. Um, so my thesis was in prediction and predictability, and there was, you know, throughout an emphasis on uh, probability statistics, state estimation, um, trying to infer uh, quantities of interest from indirect uh, measurements and, and information, Monte Carlo simulation, and the like. So, you know, I. It, no longer, I guess I'm an atmospheric scientist, but really I, I don't associate it that closely anymore. And at the end, this big bag of uh, skills that I had developed on my way to this thing has been what has sent me onward. So after postdoc, I, I ended up leaving my field to a, not that far of a lateral, but I went from so-called terrestrial meteorology to, to planetary atmospheric science. I actually started to study things on Mars. So weather and climate on Mars. I didn't know anything about Mars when I started, but it was my my experience with modeling and applied statistics that really allowed me to just switch effortlessly and hit the ground running. And uh, I was working with a, a science team that had an instrument in orbit around Mars, taking uh, taking observations, radiative you know transfer kinds of things, and we had to say something about temperature and pressure. And um, that I could do, and I was able to to make an impact thanks to my training. Unfortunately, um, almost four years into that, that lab was shut down and I had to find something else to do. And I jumped rails to uh, the private sector. I, I joined a small startup that got, that got um, acquired quickly by Thomson Reuters. But I was looking at wholesale electricity markets. We we're analyzing and predicting supply and demand fundamentals. And here's a chart of something having to do with North, uh, the Pacific Northwest Hydro. Um, and it turns out that going from weather to energy is not that uncommon, but in my case, I think I can assert that it was my, my training more in terms of modeling, state estimation, statistics, things like that, that allowed me to jump and again, make an impact and, and the like. And so while I spent over six years at this company, uh, I got a lot of information and expertise, if you will, about energy itself. Uh, and I was ready to start looking for maybe other opportunities. And I turned to our US Department of Energy. So I had not yet studied any survey stat statistics yet. So I interviewed with three different offices uh, and I've managed to work with all of them so far. I've only been here four years. My main job is within the residential energy demand team. And the main product of our team is the residential energy consumption survey, RECS it's called. It's, um, it's a study 
conducted maybe every four or five years about how Americans use energy in their homes. And the study is, is really comprised of two different surveys. One of randomly sampled homes in the US, technically every home has some chance of being selected. And we collect um, pretty comprehensive housing characteristics, like what uses of energy are there in your home? What fuels do they use? What are some of your behaviors? What are some of your demographics? And these are all the covariates, if you will, that you might want to have in your in hand if you were going to, um, oh, so sorry, the follow-on survey is the energy supplier survey. This is just a mandatory collection uh, from utilities. So we get all your bills and we know exactly how much electricity or natural gas or propane you used. So putting these together, once data has been edited and imputed and such, we, we produce end use estimates. Um, so we break down those totals into plausible official estimates of you know, what fraction of your electricity was used for air conditioning or refrigerators. And um, you know, this survey has been done off and on since 1978, but I arrived in an exciting transition time in the team's approach and methodology to this end use estimates, uh, estimation. Uh, and I had an outsized influence over what the new approach ended up being. And I say outsized relative to my seniority, but you know, I didn't have a background in survey statistics, but I was able to come in and help in this great collaborative team environment. And my opinions were taken uh, seriously. It's been really, really good, uh, good experience. It's been exciting. Other times, uh, other things at, at EIA, I've done a part-time detail in the electricity team. So pretty different than residential energy consumption. Um, this is part of a high visibility project, part of the administrator's electricity initiative. And I won't go into all the details. I spoke about it at JSM uh, in Denver last year. But basically it's, it's a new mode of collecting data for EIA. We're, we're trying to scrape publicly available data rather than make a new survey. And this project to get it going, you have to wear many different hats like product design and project manager and interface with IT to get servers stood up. And, so it's been illuminating and very exciting and just learning new things. Um, I've also covered a colleague who was out of the office for about a half a year and I got to glimpse behind the curtains at how some of these projections are done, in particular the hydropower forecasting. And that was very exciting. Um, uh, and just a different, different thing to do. Uh, I'm an active member. There's a data science working group uh, cross cut from all of EIA and uh, we're trying to, to assess cloud resources like Amazon Web Services and Azure because we're going to need to get there eventually. But basically, I get to keep learning new things, and the agency and community has enabled this. It's been really good. So here's the questions with that prelude. What are the opportunities? Well, as I had explained, there's that core four series. Um, you can either enter and do surveys, studying what's happened in the past or currently, or you could do projections and talk about what you think is going to happen in the future. And both are very important. Uh, range of skills, so definitely got to be quantitative. I think curiosity is what you need to succeed. It's team oriented. There's no lone wolf really. Um, communication, again, um, to echo Dean, it's very important in this in this uh, agency to be able to get thoughts across or influence projects like uh, I described with that end use stuff. And really, you know, it's not talked about um, often, I think, in training, but you need subject matter expertise. You can't just roam from thing to thing and do your RSEs and your, you know, differential privacy. You got to really understand something. And if you don't have that, when you get to IA, you'll get it here. Um, career path, there's not a one size fits all. Uh, you often stay within your job series through promotions. Like there's a career ladder that'll get you up to a certain level. And then you, you apply to things beyond that, maybe management, maybe non-supervisory technical positions. Are we currently hiring? I'm happy to say yes, we are. Um, there are some direct hire positions within usajobs.gov, and there are links on the next slide that you can follow when you get these slides. And the last bit, I know I'm over time, sorry, but um, what, what advice? So I thought about this a lot, and it's hard in a fifth of a slide to give something. It doesn't seem trite, but okay, here's what I came up with. Learn to code. Uh, for better or for worse, that's gonna, it's, it's the lingua franca these days. You got to learn programming well, at least one language, if not more. It's important. You got to delve deep into subjects, which is that subject matter expertise I talked about. So statisticians, um, don't be afraid. You got to get to know something. You can't just remain generalist. Uh, got to take some risks. 
along the way. Get out of your comfort zone. Do that. It's a, it'll, it'll reward you for sure. Uh, seize opportunities. If someone dangles something in front of you, uh, don't be afraid to grab it. Take those rides if you can. Stay positive uh, throughout because it can be, can be a slog. Don't burn bridges. It's a fairly relatively small community, all told, and it's important to remain collegial. And I don't know how to summarize at the end. So I, I'm going to say question everything, but so to give the benefit of the doubt, right? This is like Polonius or someone, but uh, like be respectful, but be a critic. And uh, I think that will, that will serve you well. So here are my direct hire notices that you can go click on. They're still open. Um, and I thank you for your time. All right, Greg, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Um, Bridget Manning uh, wanted to ask what kinds of coding languages are used, um, Python, R, or SAS. I'll invite uh, Jennifer Parker to go ahead and share her slides and give her presentations. But if the panelists have that in mind, uh, we, can, we can start with that in the Q&A session. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, whenever you're ready. I'm working on it. Ah. Uh oh. Sorry, it kind of went away. Let me find it. Uh, can you see the slides now? Yes, we can. See and hear. Thank you. All right, great. So again, like the other speakers, thank you for uh, inviting me to, to share uh, my, I don't know, my perspectives on statistical jobs at NCHS. I'm going to start by giving a little background um, on the National Center for Health Statistics for those of you who don't know about NCHS. Uh, we are the principal health statistics agency for the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, but we've been part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention since 1987, so we're a little bit buried in, in, into HHS, um, but we're part of the official federal statistical system. So like EIA and Census and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we are part of that system. Um, even though CDC and HHS produce a lot of data, uh, there are certain um, policies and regulations and practices followed by the federal statistical system. So NCHS, like the other agencies that we've just heard from, produce a lot of different types of data. Um, we produce micro data files. We have access to restricted data through our research data center. And then we use the data to provide information on a lot of topics uh, through you know, short reports, long reports, journal articles. We have a lot of, we're developing new tools to visualize data online and other types of online disseminations. So I'm gonna go through a few of our main data systems just to get you a feel of the types of data that I'm talking about when I talk about the health data from um, NCHS. Our largest system is the National Vital Statistics System, which is a state-based system. You've, you've heard it in the news a lot lately because this is where a lot of CDC's death data are coming from, is our vital statistics system. But it's, it's a really old system. Um, you know, computerized data from the system are available over decades, and we have reports through the vital statistics um, from 1890. Um, but I wanna make, I clear that it's a state-based system. So we collect data that are collected by the states and then we put it together. Uh, and there's 57 vital registration jurisdictions. Uh, New York City is its own jurisdiction. Uh, we get data from the territories. So there's a little bit, of, you know, again, you, you might hear in the news about some of the, the COVID death data. Um, our death data are coming through the states and, and as such are going through those processes. And as you might imagine, you know, states have their own ways of doing things. And, and our job is to harmonize those for, for our, our disseminations. Um, for reference, in terms of statistical, um, you know, work, there's about 200, uh, 2.8 million deaths each year and 4 million births each year. And so that's about the size of those data files. 
So in addition to the, the births and deaths, uh, which are, you know, universe data, we actually collect a lot of information through surveys. Uh, our big population health surveys include the National Health Interview Survey, which currently collects data from about 35,000 households each year. Uh, well, actually, currently, it's actually collecting data through telephone now, <laughs> and some of the data are not, not being collected. Um, but it's a survey, and traditionally, it's been face-to-face, -face where we ask information about health status, health conditions, have you ever been told you have diabetes? Have you ever been told you have heart disease? Things like that. Behavioral risk factors. Have, do you smoke? Do you drink alcohol? Do you have access to health insurance? Do you, where do you get you, your usual sources of care? Um, and this survey has been in the field since the 1950s, but its design changes every decade when we get data from the census and the instrument changes. And by instrument, I mean the, the, the survey questionnaire. So one of our other flagship surveys, which is again out of the field right now, but we're planning on putting it back in the field as soon as we can, is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a survey where we have the mobile examination centers or big trailers, and we go to about 15 locations a year, uh, counties typically, uh, 30 in a two-year data release. And, and we use these big mobile examination centers or trailers to do physical exams and lab, get laboratory tests. We do some personal interviews. Um, these data are used to um, also get dietary intake from people. And, and these are the data that are used by the um, USDA to understand our usual intakes and to set standards for uh, recommended daily allowances and things like that. Uh, these are the data also that are used to um, get the anthropometric measures, uh, height and weight. And so every year or every two years, you'll see how many people are overweight in this country, and this is where a lot of those data come from. These are also data that collect a lot of environmental information. So if you see childhood blood lead levels in, in the United States, these are the data where um, those numbers come from. In addition to our population health surveys, we, all, we collect information from establishments, uh, you know, like businesses at the Census Bureau or Bureau of Labor Statistics, but in our case, they're from usually hospitals, physician offices. Um, in our long-term care study, we're getting data from nursing homes and home health agencies, adult day services, you know, institutions like that. And, and th these collections of surveys uh, provide information on uh, what type of data are being used by people in this country. So for example, if you go back to our, our vital statistics system, we might get information on how many people have died with, uh, of heart disease in, in the United States. If we go to our population health surveys, we might ask people, you know, have you ever been told you have health disease in this, or heart disease? And, um, and, and our healthcare surveys will track people that are being seen for health, uh, heart disease in, in the country. So, we're looking at health from a lot of different perspectives uh, with, with these data uh, systems. Another big program, uh, uh, statistical program at NCHS is our data linkage program where we take our, our population health surveys and we link to administrative records like the Medicare and Medicaid data from the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, we link to mortality data so that we can understand uh, mortality for different um, for populations with different health characteristics. We've also linked to data from the Social Security Administration and from Housing and Urban Development. And again, these these linkages allow uh, researchers to ask uh, a broader range of, of questions with our data than normally would have been available with just the, the surveys. Um, I lead the Division of Research and Methodology, so I'll just put a plug in for some of the work we do there. Uh, our division has three units. One is the Collaborating Center for Questionnaire Design and Evaluation Research. Um, it, we don't have a lot of statisticians in that group, although they do work to test survey questions that get on our surveys. And so um, the, the work they do really uh, has an impact on some of the statistical inferences one makes from our surveys. 
Uh, the Research Data Center is in my division, and that's where researchers externally come to access our, our restricted data. And um, the unit that you might be most familiar with would be our Collaborating Center for Statistical Research and Survey Design, where most of the mathematical statisticians at NCHS uh, work. So like Greg was showing the, you know, the core four, I, I have um, five different uh, job series uh, that USA Jobs sets up, you know, the 1530s, the 1529s, the 601s, uh, of types of stati statistical work being done at NCHS. And by far the largest group of people in a statistical series are the, those in the 1530 series. Um, the survey statisticians, the health statisticians, the demographers. Uh, these are people typically with master's degrees doing statistical work that supports the data programs. Not entirely, but I'll, I'll just say generally. Um, the 1529 mathematical statisticians uh, largely are in the Division of Research and Methodology, but not entirely. We have mathematical statisticians in the other data programs as well. Um, the 601 epidemiologists are health scientists, but many of them, most of them have a, a lot of statistical background. And so people have different, bring different um, academic skills and it doesn't always line up. Um, you know, I was not a 1529 for a, lot of, for a lot of years. I am now, but I wasn't always. I think sometimes it just depends on the job that, um, you know, one, ad, one applies for. So it's not completely the, the job that, um, you know, not completely tied to your education. And, and we also have the uh, computer science and, and social scientists that have statistical training. So I'm going to speed through, not, I'm trying not to speed through, but I'm just going to talk about the job opportunities at NCHS. Um, you know, I, I, my, my training was as a biostatistician, so I've always been like a, a what's the, the saying, a kid in a candy jar, uh, a kid in a candy store with uh, NCHS because there's just so many different things related to, to health and statistics. Uh, we do sampling, sample design, sample weights. We assess the non-response bias uh, associated with people not responding to our surveys. Uh, we also look at other things related to our surveys in the survey methodology, like uh, you know, how do adaptive design works? Are there interviewer effects on our surveys? Are there mode effects? Do people respond differently by telephone or in person? Uh, the record linkage program uh, examines different methods for rank linkage as well as doing linkage. We look at disclosure and confidentiality. Uh, we're, we're getting into new techniques, um, well, new to us, natural language processing and other machine learning methods. Um, but in addition to the data production, we do a lot of data analysis, and I have that separate, you know, we, we have people that write the subject matter reports, often the epidemiologists, but again, many of them have a lot of statistical training. We do modeling and predictions, we look at trends. Uh, we do imputations and visualizations. Uh, we also work to uh, help others use our data. So we produce analytic guidelines and we look at presentation standards for communicating the quality of, not necessarily the data itself, but the quality of an estimate and, and what, what are best practices for using the data to learn about health. And I'll say that a lot of those, I'll, I'll go, well, I'm not going to go back, but a lot of those jobs, a lot of those activities have a range of, of um, statistical activities associated with them, both, you know, research and evaluation and say record linkage, how, and what are the methods, as well as statisticians who do the record linkage. Uh, we do, we study different weighting approaches, but then we have statisticians who are doing the weights. Um, so I think that there's a range of different statistical activities, even with um, the, the statistical topics that, that we look at. So um, again, I, I just say there's a, a wide range of things that are, are being done at the agencies, at the agency. Um, so I, I put all these questions here at the end, and, and I'm going to start with the, the second one. What is the career path for statisticians in your organization? And I was thinking about that, and I think, you know, like, um, like was said earlier, you know, it's a collaborative group, and um, 
you know, Dean said it, it's like a guild approach. But when I look back at my own career, I've been at NCHS for about 25 years now. The things that I was doing when I first started I, are very different from, well, very different from what I'd be doing now, just in terms of the technology available. When I first started, we didn't, I didn't have access to the internet. We didn't have email. Uh, you know, just the way of doing things uh, differed. Um, I started off doing a data analysis. I was doing some health studies. I was um, looking at children's health. I was using all of our, di our di different systems. And I was working with subject matter experts in, in, in doing some of those outcomes work. Um, eventually, I was asked to be a manager. And then I, I led the record linkage program for a few years, and, and um, which was a very different skill set, but it was um, uh, well, it was a different skill set, but it was also, uh, you know, for me, it was very interesting because I was able to look at the data in a new way. Um, from there, I went to the NHANES program where I was the senior statistician with, and I provided input on a range of statistical activities related to both the design of the survey and the analysis of the data. Uh, when Matt Schenker retired in 2017, I became the acting director of the Division of Research and Methodology and eventually the director. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of different career paths one could take. And I, and I think what Greg said about seizing opportunities is really uh, what I would say, what I would recommend to people because, um, you know, in an agency or an organization where you're, you're, you, you're really getting involved, you, you see other opportunities to where you can get, in, um, where you can make a difference. And I, I think that's, um, you, you shouldn't be afraid to actually do those sorts of things because you can um, really bring to uh, bring a lot from where you start to to a new opportunity. Um, some skills that have really helped me in all of these roles is is the ability to translate the statistical concepts to the health professionals, uh, and also translate the health information back to the statisticians. It actually does go both ways. And I, we've talked a lot about communication, but um, I think people have different skills in that area and being able to take the subject matter, uh, your subject matter knowledge and back to some statisticians who might not be able to see things in the same way is also important. Um, do I know all the statistical uh, do I have the answer to all the statistical questions at NCHS? Uh, no, not, e not even close. Um, particularly now that I do a lot of management. But I have a good idea of where to ask. Um, when I took the job in the linkage program, I spent a lot of time learning about linkage. I, I hadn't done that before. And um, it, was, it was great fun to learn a new skill and to get involved in that. And, I think a lot of times people are afraid that because they weren't trained in something that they can't do it. But I, I think that um, you really can learn on the job and, and take advantage of those opportunities. And I look, looks like we're running out of time. So um, the other thing I would, would recommend to you is to, you know, I think that seizing the opportunities and not being afraid is, um, is maybe a, what a piece of advice I, I, I would pass along. I, I tell people at NCHS that, and I work with a lot of physicians at NCHS, and um, just like there are physicians who are trained in uh, pediatrics and there are physicians that are trained in cancer, you know, I, I try to remind them that statisticians are not necessarily a one size fits all either. Um, and that we also need, we have specializations where some of us know about surveys, some of us know about linkage, uh, but what ties us together is that we can understand a little bit about what each other does. And I, and I think, um, I think that's one of the things we should remember that um, we can, we can learn new things and that we can specialize and that we can be generalists, but we don't have to be a, a we don't need to, to know everything all the time. Um, 
So I'll, I'll just close by saying that uh, jobs and statistical agencies are fun. There's a lot of different things that you can do. NCHS is hiring. Uh, we, we advertise, uh, you know, on USA Jobs. And, um, and I think I'll just stop there. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, our presentations have gone just a little bit long, but I do want to make sure we get to some questions that have been posed. Uh, one question simply came about uh, location of these agencies. They're all the campuses in the DC area. Uh, do you have satellite offices or um, any sorts of opportunities elsewhere in the country? Would any of the panelists like to respond to that? I, NIH is in Bethesda. Okay, Bethesda, Maryland. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer? Uh, we have uh, offices in North Carolina and we have uh, our research data center has a group in Atlanta okay. at the CDC headquarters. Greg? EIA's only official location is uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, that forest hall building I showed, but there are um, some exceptions for permanent telework arrangements, but mm -hmm. it's mainly in D.C. Yeah. Um, many departments are headquartered in DC. In my case at USDA, we do have a regional field office structure. So from time to time, there are uh, government jobs, federal government jobs that appear in other parts of the country. Uh, Jennifer, one of the participants uh, that saw something on your slide that sparked an interest. He was curious about the uh, natural language processing. Can you say just a little bit more about where that might be applied uh, in the work? Yes, yeah, so this is an area that we're really uh, trying to develop. We have um, in, in two different data programs, one the vital statistics, where we get a lot of verbatims on the death certificates that we don't really code that frequently. You know, I think it became very important last year when we were coding types of opioids. And that was um, something we were trying to understand because, because we wanted to make sure that we um, captured the right uh, uh, the, the right deaths in, in those categories. The other area is with our, um, our healthcare surveys where we're trying to go through some of the um, medical records and, and capture some of the, the main uh, features or the most salient uh, features of some of the, the verbatims there. Okay, and I just wanted to follow up on a uh, question that Bridget Manning posed about uh, kind of preferences for software languages. Uh, Dean responded in the chat, but uh, Dean, you mentioned uh, MS uh, hirees uh, kind of helping with programming. Uh, what kinds of proficiencies would you look for in an applicant uh, at that level? Um, basically, they need to know how to code in R and uh, be good at it, basically. Um, and, and that sort of comes out in the interview, I would say. Okay. Um, do, do you have any, any, any interactions with uh, FDA or um, some of the reviews that they do where kind of there's a presumption that it's submitted in SAFs or uh, something of that nature? We have a lot of interactions with the FDA, but um, we don't really get involved in that uh, submission stuff so much. That's done more by groups that we contract with and so on. Okay. And Greg, on your uh, programming acumen, uh, you mentioned some of the scraping that you do to collect data. What kinds of softwares have you, you've been using for that? Did you already come to the agency with those skills or how did you build those skills? Right, thanks. Um, I came to the agency with um, skills in more like MATLAB and Fortran, those kinds of uh, languages that are more for dynamical kind of scientific computing. And um, when I got to EIA, I learned SAF, which is the lingua franca for most survey stuff, it seems. On the analysis side, the, the, the modeling, the for, the, there's some Fortran and some other, uh, that's being replaced, so don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Python and R are abound. So it's growing in popularity. The scraping you re referenced is in Python, and I basically learned that in 2019. So this is all kind of new and you can learn while you earn, so to speak, on the job. Excellent. Uh, Jennifer, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, I think most of our data production work is done in SAS uh, and a lot of our analysis work is done using its, its uh, Sudan, which works with SAS. 
Um, a lot of our research applications are done in R and Python. So it really varies. Okay. And there was an important question that was asked, um, are these positions open only to US citizens? Uh, uh, Dean's responded in the chat and we'll, we'll let him go. Uh, but there's an opportunity to convert uh, non-citizens as uh, hire as contractors and then convert them. Um, and, and I think it's been my experience at USDA that uh, the full-time federal employment uh, citizenship or um, citizenship is a requirement, but we do engage contractors uh, through National Institute of Statistical Sciences uh, who, who work on site with us. So there are opportunities certainly to engage with these agencies, I believe. Right. Right. We also have a program, um, a service fellow program. So there are some jobs actually advertised on our webpage um, that are open to non-citizens. They're, they're usually temporary positions. Uh, I know that um, another good question coming in is what kinds of professional development opportunities do our agency support and do you routinely present at uh, funded conference uh, opportunities? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll answer that. We actually encourage people to present at conferences um, and um, NCHS is located in Hyattsville, Maryland, which you might never have heard of, but we're right next to the University of Maryland College Park, which is where the joint program and survey methodology is, is located. <laughs> so uh, we do encourage people to take uh, courses uh, through the JPSM program and um, other training opportunities. And Greg, I know uh, you and I met at uh, JSM in Denver where you presented your work. So. Uh, correct. So there is definitely support to present at conferences. There's also support to just attend conferences. So kind of be a tourist and learn a lot. Um, and there is also support for training if you have if you want to get a skill that you don't have. SAS, if you want to learn SAS, but also if you want to learn um, project management or leadership, there's also support for, for programs like that. And it's you know clearly carved out in the budget, and managers uh, approach employees and ask what they want to do and, and champion them. So it's it's good. Yeah, and I'll just add that at USDA, not just at my particular agency, but department wide, uh, they're trying to build these kinds of communities of practice around uh, data visualization, around advanced analytics. And so there are opportunities formally and informally for an exchange of ideas. Uh, for building additional skill sets and uh, things of that nature. We're approaching the end of the hour here. So if there are any lingering questions, uh, we can address those. Uh, otherwise, um, I wanna thank the speakers for their time, uh, Dr. Fullman, Jennifer Parker, uh, Greg Lawson. And on behalf of NIST, just thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, reach out and recruit on behalf of uh, our, our agencies. We really appreciate it and uh, wish all the students and job seekers uh, the best of success in their job search. So thank you all very much. Thank you.